Hey everyone. I uh, hope you guys are all having a great Wednesday. Um, we're really excited to have you guys joining us today. Um, today we've got Brandon Orr. He is the mobility planning lead over at TY Lynn. Um, so Brandon's got quite a presentation built out for us. So I'm really excited um, to kind of jump into things. So Brandon, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks, Ashley. So I'm um, really happy to be here talking about some holistic city planning and new approach. Talking about how some different ways we can perceive some of these city planning issues and how we can leverage some, you know, big data um, to maybe answer some questions that maybe can't be answered in a black box that we can't definitely, for instance, uh, one example I have is, you know, oftentimes it would be great if we could quantify exactly how many people are going to use a bike lane in the future, but that question or that answer is very difficult to answer uh, given the limited data we often have on studies. And it's talking about how maybe we can answer or or touch on some of those aspects without having to directly answer, you know, the specific question on how many people are going to ride the bike. Maybe it's looking at different questions on how can we answer some other questions to show, hey, more people are likely to ride the bike. And it's kind of within that vein and how we can use data to supplement, you know, some qualitative aspects on projects to give more insights into what we're trying to achieve. So throughout this um, presentation, uh, there's about three parts to it. One is just getting to the root core of, you know, what are the fundamentals of city design? You know, why do cities exist? And how does that paint, you know, our philosophy and how we're planning things and how we can view things when we're, we're dealing with city planning issues? The second thing is, you know, where are our blind spots? Where does the current way of thinking or analyzing solutions potentially lead to some blind spots where uh, some better solutions or some viable solutions are maybe not looked at uh, because of that? And the last part is just kind of looking at, you know, a lot of the things we've been doing in the past, you know, decade and city planning and placemaking um, has become more integrated. It hasn't become more siloed. It's become more holistic in terms of, you know, now we understand when we plan a roadway, there's these unintended consequences uh, in terms of environmental impacts. And you know those environmental impacts lead to other unintended consequences under other disciplines. And it's you know understanding how can we integrate more of a holistic approach. You know even though we do work in our different silos sometimes, how can we incorporate a holistic approach with data um, to maybe you know set up the the, the landscape so that some of these other external questions with other disciplines can be answered through our work, even if we're not directly working on them. Um, so some background about me. So academically, I am an urban planner. I studied at the University of Waterloo in Ontario, Canada. Uh, through that, I specialized in GIS and transportation. And a lot of that was because uh, in high school, I played a lot of SimCity. And so I went to some school fairs and they're like, hey, do urban planning. And then when I got into urban planning, I realized that a whole bunch of the, the transportation planning industry was actually engineering based. And so I thought, hey, you know, I'm not gonna not gonna go and study engineering for four years now that I've discovered this, but maybe I'll focus on GIS and how that relates to transportation to see if I can bolster up my urban planning strengths in that regards. And so here I am 10 years later and I've built a bit of a specialization on transportation master planning. And that's led me to a lot of interesting places, including all the way in uh, the Canadian Arctic, where I did a transportation master plan for the city of Iqaluit in Nunavut. Um, that presented a lot of challenges in that regard. I've also had the privilege of working on some curbside management plans in the city of Tampa and Florida, uh, as well as naturally my hometown in, in Toronto, working on mobility projects uh, around here. Uh, and one other fun fact is, uh, I've been a hockey referee for 16 years, so I'm very used to dealing with conflicting opinions uh, from all sides of things, including council, as well as at hockey, hockey games as well. So I'm used to dealing with conflict and it's been uh, an interesting using that skill within the urban planning space. Um, so when we go into the city fundamentals, so realistically, when you distill a city, even from ancient times, some of the first cities, I mean, they popped up on areas where you know inhabitants could access goods and services and really from that the reality is that you know we're on humans this place is really hostile and we like to live with other people that can look out for us and we can help out each other and it's really about cities at their core are about community um, they facilitate the interaction of people you know you meet your friends on the street you shop at business businesses and, and not only that the skills that you and your friends have provide value to the economy you know if you are a you know, an individual that has a specialized skill in a city, 
you know, it's valuable to that city because you're bringing new knowledge there. And, you know, that knowledge, if it's in isolation, is difficult to start generating economic activity. And so really cities are these great connectors where you can get access to new opportunities, uh, but it also presents um, different opportunities with the skills you already have. And so when we look at that real reason of why cities exist, you know, one of the primary challenges of facilitating, facilitating that function of a city is, you know, maximizing the interaction between people and places while minimizing friction. And friction can come in a, in a variety of ways. I, I have a specialization in mobility, so friction is often quantified in terms of congestion or uh, a loading capacity on a transit bus. But, you know, if you think about it, even in Toronto, the Raptors won the, the NBA finals a couple of years and the whole downtown was packed with pedestrians, right? And that's, you know, a great thing. A lot of people are out there celebrating, and, but that also, you know, at its very, at a kind of basic sense, led to some friction where, you know, cars couldn't travel or, you know, people were concerned that they would be stuck in these crowds, not being able to get around. So, you know, it's, it's kind of balancing that it's a great event. You know, people want to experience it, people want to access stores, but we're all traversing, you know, this public realm um, that municipalities often have to maintain. And it's how do we balance all those different needs to facilitate these interactions? And that's really the crux of where the challenge is in city planning, in my opinion. Um, and when we view from that perspective, it's not so much, you know, you start viewing it more from the human perspective. It's like these challenges at the very end, you know, why does a city exist? It's because people make decisions and the city has grown uh, in that way, you know? And, you know, why are all cities different? You know, there's very defined guidelines in engineering and in architecture on how to design a building given the certain context. Um, you know, you can replicate an exact same building in one city and put it in another city, uh, but that's not what's going to let it be used the same way because inevitably it's the people that live in that building, the people in that community, they're going to use it in a particular way. And that's why, you know, you know, you look at the history of master plan cities and, you know, very rarely do master plans ever achieve what, you know, the ultimate goal is. Um, because sometimes it comes down to the nature of the people that end up being there and kind of what opportunities they have. And I think when we view that, it's kind of looking at, you know, these city fundamentals are a bit larger than just oftentimes the scope we may get on one project. So oftentimes I may get a study to do an environmental assessment to widen a roadway uh, in a community. And so oftentimes the question is, you know, how can we increase capacity on this roadway while mitigating environmental concerns. Um, but oftentimes that scope is only limited to so many things you can analyze, and there may be a whole bunch of other things that you can't analyze. Uh, but what I'm trying to get with this is just the acknowledgement that you know, cities are not necessarily always there because we've designed them to be there. Uh, they're there because you know we, we implement some design, but it's ultimately how the people that come and live in these places affect those designs. And so it's kind of just getting away from this idea that you know every solution can be done in a black box that you know you can quantify every solution and come up with a perfectly satisfied answer to solve all your ills. And I think what I'm just trying to get here is that cities are tremendously complex. And just because of that nature, it's very difficult to ever achieve a perfect consensus on a study despite the fact that maybe the way we operate on studies looks to kind of quantify things so that I can show the best benefit. Um, and kind of this leads into blind spots. You know, um, there were some um, professors of planning uh, at the University of Berkeley in the 70s, uh, Horace Riddle and Melvin Weber, and they define city planning problems as wicked problems. And I'm not much one for these catchphrase words. I think they're used too much. But what wicked problems are, are problems that are challenging because they are ill-defined, complex, and constantly changing. And I think one thing I've realized throughout my career in, in city planning and in transportation planning is that oftentimes we are planning solutions and it's almost like we have an assumption that things you know, will stay the same, but they're also gonna change. It's like we project growth, but we use historical trends to project the future, right? When, you know, when we look at history, things are always changing. Things are constantly changing. It's like what today, the, the factory today in your community could be operating, but in two years, something in the market could completely change and, and all those residents could be out of work and that completely change your community, right? And so it's almost like we have these problems that are wicked, that are hard to define, they're complex and they're constantly changing, 
but oftentimes we try to solve them with very defined solutions. So we're trying to solve a very undefined problem with a solution that we think is very defined. And I'll get into it in a bit, of, in a bit but it's also kind of at the cusp of why, at the crux of why, you know, it's very difficult to cut and paste one solution for one community to another community because, you know, what, what you may think makes one community unique, we may not even notice that that's something else in another community that's making it unique. Like the demographics, you know, that per, the people that live in that community, they could have a certain job that predisposes them to need for instance, more physiotherapy, in which that will attract more physiotherapists to the community, for instance. That's a very abstract idea. But at a high level, it's an interconnected nature. If you know we plan the cities and it's connected to the economy that these cities operate in. And you know, when we plan plan these these projects, oftentimes it leads to a blind spot where you know we take the the existing conditions at face flat value and often extrapolate you know, what's currently there and fail to look at what could be there in the future because we look at it that way. And here's an example kind of on the right of, you know, a wicked problem just kind of mocked together here um, in terms of planning. It's like oftentimes you may get tasked to, you know, do a study on any single one of these. Like you may be asked to do a climate change study for a community, but that inevitably, you know, impacts all these other elements that are intrinsically, you know, connected to it, right? And just like when you do a land use study, that impacts transportation, that impacts, you know, uh, the ability for aging residents to get care and access care, right? And and so it's just kind of emphasizing how all this stuff is connected and we just need to be cognizant of that, how that leads to blind spots. Another way that, you know, this might lead to blind spots um, is kind of the ways that we frame the question. So oftentimes, especially from my background as a transportation professional, oftentimes these studies are framed you know, with a solution in mind. So they say, do a traffic operational study for this corridor that's congested and find an operational solution to improve it, right? But sometimes if you're just looking at a corridor in a small chunk like that, the solutions are afforded to you are very constricted, right? You may be able to widen the roadway, you might be able to adjust the intersections, um, but maybe none of those might be needed if you take a a higher level look at it and say, hey, maybe we can distribute traffic away and we don't need to widen it, right? And so oftentimes some of the problems that, you know, we deal with in our work and in our scope are often scoped in such a way that it almost kind of lets, it almost kind of tells you what the solution is going to be before you even start sometimes, right? And that's one way that could be very effective if, for instance, there's, you know, if you're designing a, a motor, right? You already know you need to get certain propulsion. And so you iterate on that same design to get a more efficient motor, right? So that's kind of more of that analytical proto prototyping. Another way to look at it is more of the design prototyping where it's kind of starts off more with a curiosity. It doesn't say, look, we need to have a more efficient motor. It says, what does the motor do? The motor transports people from one area to the other. And therefore it says, okay, well, why is this question being asked? right it starts off with a curiosity is there a better way to transport people it doesn't come down to we need a more efficient motor that can get us faster so we can move more people it says do we even need to use the motor to transport people in the first place that's a that may not be the best example but i guess i hope you get what i'm saying it's about kind of how you frame the question and say you know if you start off with this is an operational problem or this is a traffic problem therefore you must come up with a traffic solution you may be constrained to only coming up with a solution that might be perfectly viable from a traffic perspective, but could be missing out on another opportunity that could be involving another discipline, like a land use tool. Like maybe you can adjust land uses to adjust the need for um, roadway expansion, for instance. I know that is done in certain instances. I'm just reinforcing how this kind of uh, plays out. Whereas, you know, the design prototype is kind of like, you know, you have a roadway, it's congested, and you say, oh, okay, um, let's find out a different way to do it. Maybe we don't want to widen the roadway, even though that is the, the tried and proven approach uh, to dealing with these challenges. Maybe there's a way to look at a different way to address it. Um, and that kind of leads into this holistic planning notion, kind of, I know I'm kind of hitting it on the nail, kind of like this quote a little bit, but it's, you know, if the only tool you have is a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail. And I think we all, get into that. Me being a transportation professional, I have my own biases where I may see a problem at face value and I say, oh yeah, that's a 
transportation problem. But you know, if you think about it a bit more, dig under the surface, you may say, oh no, actually it's a you know a planning a land use problem, or you know maybe it's an, a social equity problem where there's a lot of crime, and that's why no one's coming here. You know, and that's why the the road isn't lively, right? And so that's one thing we always got to I think we always got to recognize when we're dealing with these problems is that the tools that we have are to our disposal. They're just tools. It comes down to really understanding what that root question is and making sure that we're being fair to that question and being open minded to it. And you know, they, I just kind of broke these down on kind of how I just generally visualize. There's three general pillars I view. Kind of a lot of studies. Um, that revolve around city planning focus on, you know, there's community studies focused on kind of the people element, the demographics, the land use, you know, the economics, public engagement, all that stuff, understanding what the community wants. Uh, the other aspect is connectivity. How do those people connect? You know, how do goods, you know, how does wireless technology, how does, you know, traffic get conveyed from one area to another? How do these communities connect to each other? And the last part, um, the last pillar of this is sustainability. You know, uh, we have people that live in a the community, they need to move around, but you know, every action has a reaction by nature of us building, it has a consequence on our environment. Uh, and not only that, just, you know, the way we live as well has a consequence on our environment in terms of sustainability. And so it really focuses on that there's these functional aspects, there's a human aspect, and then there's these, the natural aspect upon which, you know, these three pillars I view need to kind of work cohesively, you know, so that, we don't have unintended or too many un unintended consequences across disciplines. I know that's a very big idea, but just the general philosophy of holistic planning. Um, here's an example, kind of a high level example that we did with Urban SDK on how we kind of use this approach and maybe a, a more untraditional uh, way. And so we were working on this uh, mobility hub in Thunder Bay. It's a city of 100,000 in Northern Ontario. So it's not a, you know, metropolis by any um, stretch of the imagination, but it's not, for, for Ontario standards, it's not a, not a small city. Um, and they wanted to relocate this transit hub from one area on the waterfront to a more centralized location. And what, what started off is this study at first was really purely a transit study on, look, our buses are wasting too much time to get to this other terminal. Can we get something more efficient? You know, is it better to relocate here? And, you know, that was a valid question. It was something that was important to them because it was costing money to the taxpayers in the community and the ridership wasn't, wasn't there. But what we were able to do with, you know, pulling in a bit more information and a bit more data that looked at this in a bit more of a holistic sense was able to change what could have been, you know, just a very functional piece of infrastructure and turning it into more of a catalyst or a solution um, that could extend its benefits beyond transit in terms of public realm, in terms of social equity and all these things. And that's really because we were able to get more information on the nuances of how people interact and, and arrive within North Course. So, you know, with Urban SDK's platform, we were able to get some really good data on trip distribution, understanding, you know, where are people going? Uh, trip distance, how far do people travel? Trip duration, how long are people traveling for? And average speeds, you know, which corridors are, are, are busier or less busy. And the reason this is important is, you know, a lot of times studies are done based on a volume analysis. So they say there's a lot of cars operated on the street, the roadway's congested, uh, but that's just one small picture. That's a symptom. That's not the root cause, right? The symptom may be that a lot of people are traveling on a roadway and it leads to congestion, but we have to understand why are people traveling on that roadway? Why is it leading congestion? because that's the real reason, that's a real thing we wanna address, right? If people are being forced to use their cars because there's just plain no options, even though you know they may be eligible to use active transportation or transit, um, then we're gonna, you know, if we're only viewing volume, we're gonna come up with a solution that's gonna focus on rectifying volume, right? And so we did a concerted effort to say, no, we wanna look beyond that and take a look at how this community, even though we're looking at it from a, traffic engineer and transportation planning perspective, we want to look at how this relates to land uses and you know the demographics in the area, because ultimately those are the people that are going to be using this system, right? And we were able to do some fancy plots and all this stuff, but one of the cool things that we were able to find out with this is that unbeknownst to a lot of the people in that area, uh, you know, a lot of the businesses in that area at least, is that you know the majority of trips 
coming to the study area, we're coming within one to three kilometers. We're, we're perfectly you know, within that range that could be suitable for active transportation or transit. And so this is an example talking about that holistic planning and how sometimes, you know, I can't, I can't say without, uh, without, uh, without any um, where I can't say definitively that there's going to be a hundred new transit riders in five years because you put a transit route there. But taking this data, what we can say is give an educated understanding of the nuances and say, look, we see that, you know, X percentage of your trips are coming from this area and they're going between these areas. So the likelihood, if you put a route there, you know, this could be your potential catchment. It's very difficult to pinpoint accurately how many people, but this gives you some useful information to understand, hey, this area might be more desirable, even though I can't quantify exactly how many transit riders at this juncture, it lets me know at, at a high level, this might be a better candidate, right? So that's one way, you know, it's quantitative data. It's not the exact quantitative data you want, but it allows you to create a bit more of a qualitative inference you know, on the real question you want to answer. And it's a similar thing we do with, you know, active transportation. For instance, we use that trip distribution distance plot, and then we found, you know, X proportion of people traveled a certain distance, and we overlaid that with spatial analysis. So we did a, an analysis called betweenness index that shows, you know, which links on the roadway are oriented in such a fashion so that the more between. See, so this analysis shows us which routes are more likely to be taken, but it can't quantify exactly how many people are going to take that route in the future. It just says, look, based on these characteristics, we can qualitatively say this area is likely to be more desirable for active transportation. And that's another way we were able to orient um, cycling routes around this terminal. So for instance, um, just for your knowledge, if you're not aware, angular and Euclidean distance, Euclidean distance can be thought of as if your GPS was giving you directions. So, you know, they don't really care if it's simple, they just want to get you as quickly and as efficiently there. So it may involve a lot of turns, but it'll give you the quickest path. Whereas angular distance is, it'll, it'll get you there quickly, but the goal is to minimize the amount of turns to get there. So it's usually more directional data. So if you ask someone at the gas, at the gas shop or at the at the at, ga at the gas pump. Hey, I need directions to a place. They would likely say, "Hey, go down five kilometer or go down five miles, and then make a left, and then do the first right." So it's very simple directions. Whereas a GPS might tell you there's this back road, and you can go through this alley and get there quicker, right? So these red lines we see here are air, are streets that are more desirable from an angular um, between this index, whereas the darker lines are more desirable from a Euclidean perspective. And so we were able to use this to come up with some recommendations on how routes, cycling routes get connected to the transit terminal. But the key thing here was linking this information with the spatial data so that we could have a, rare, a fairly confident assessment of, hey, these areas might be good for active transportation. Um, and once again, we couldn't quantify how many people, but we say, hey, based on this distribution, based on the spatial data, you know, these things give us a qualitative understanding that this area might be uh, desirable for active transportation. Another element to this is using the average trip distances and distribution, we were able to quantify some other things that are a bit more difficult to quantify purely from a volume perspective. Um, so for instance, we were able to kind of quantify um, you know, GHG reductions. This example was more GHG reductions from the transit buses having to relocate how much uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, reductions there would be in the year's savings. But this data also allowed us to quantify how many GHG reductions could perhaps be obtained if certain portions of mode shift were shifted away from automobile from those periphery areas that were within one to three kilometers. And that helped us drive a very enticing narrative to propose some more cutting, well, I call them cutting edge, but more um, innovative ideas like being able to reallocate road space. So this space here, this is our conceptual terminal design. But what this data allowed us to do is at, at the beginning, when we started this conversation with the client, it was like, no way, no how are we going to switch this to a pedestrian realm, right? And then once we started getting more information and started building that narrative and showing, hey, look, you know, this is where you are today, but this is the opportunity because this is how all these pieces fit together. And this is the benefits you can have from an environmental sustainable perspective, you know, what this can do for social equity, crime in the area. It started to make a lot more sense that something like this was going to lead to more benefits for the community. And, and this kind of the, the whole purpose of this was how could we use this big data from urban SDK 
to solve this transit problem, but also solve a couple of other problems at the same time. And it just kind of comes down to this new trend that's going on, I think. And I'm not an architect, but I appreciate design and architecture. This idea of how, how our infrastructure could be multifunctional. It doesn't have to be single use. Just because something is a transit terminal doesn't mean it has to only be used for transit. It could serve transit purposes and also provide other community benefits like public realm. You know, in this in this instance here in New York, they have a, a green roof that that uh, people can walk on to, and, uh, and same thing with this museum, right? So there's different ways you can incorporate multifunctional elements into your design, but the cusp of it, you know, these solutions don't get developed in a silo, right? They require a holistic, at least a look or consideration to develop these solutions, so that you can make, you know, an appropriate narrative and and case so that not only can your clients buy in, but the public can buy in as well, right? Um, so that's pretty much the the end of my conversation. I know it ended a bit abrupt, but I guess if, if you could take one thing from this from this webinar is really, I was just trying to get to the root of, you know, cities are there because we're people and we want to meet other people. We want to do things, we want to do cool things in our cities, right? And, you know, sometimes if we frame the question and we're not, you know, being open-minded to how we frame that question, it could lead us to coming up with solutions that are perfectly good based off of you know what we've done in the past, but it could be missing out on some potential better solutions in the future. And kind of tying with that is this idea of holistic planning and how we can use you know big data, data-driven approaches, you know, to maybe not quantify exactly the answer that we're trying to get, but get an approximation or a proxy of it so that we can speak to it in a bit of an educated way uh, to drive some of these more innovative ideas. There we go. So I'm opening it up for discussion. I don't know, Ashley, if what you want to do. Perfect. Thank you, Brandon. That was super, super interesting. Uh, we do have a few questions that have come in. And if anyone else on has questions, please feel free to submit them. Uh, but Brandon, if you don't mind, I'm just going to go through a couple of questions. And as we get more, uh, we can answer those as well. Sounds good. Perfect. Um, the first question was, how accurate is the data? So the accuracy of the data, it has to come down. So it will depend on your sample size, right? At the end of the day, this study, what I did, it the budget did not afford to do a tremendous amount of counts so that we could validate the data. And so it's one of those things where you have to work with your client and understand what their tolerance is um, for that. So for instance, my philosophy is, is sometimes you get census data, but it could be old by five years, right? And so I find it preferable to use that census data and then have something like Urban SDK that, you know, it provides the raw sample data and uh, an observance that are collected and it's not factored up. You know, you could do that if you collect counts, but if you're constricted for, uh, for budget, and my philosophy is if you blend it with kind of that census data and look at what the trends are, it's still telling you a trend, even though you can't quantify, look, this, this distribution um, equates, we factored in and expanded it and it equates, you know, how many thousand trips we can't do that but if we if we if we treat it you know with a bit of caution like that and say it is you know the observances it is a, a sample and you know in this case we don't have anything better in this community we can try and validate with counts but if the budget is limited this may be a perfectly acceptable solution uh, for the client given you know that balance it's better to have some sense of what that distribution is than to just take a volume count one eight hour count one sample which is urban sdk you know they provided us pre-pandemic data for two months 15 minute intervals for two months and they provided us for post pandemic so you know in my books you know i take eight hour counts and you know oftentimes we don't have someone out there knowing if there's construction going on ideally in the perfect world we would know but that's one small snapshot right and so when i view it that way yeah could it be more accurate could we factor it up if we validate with counts yeah but to answer your question more specifically, in this instance, we took it based off of those distributions. We used it for distributions to look at more proportions because it was more of a, a high level approach. We didn't need to get too microscopic on this study. Perfect. Um, the next question we have is what's the biggest value that you saw? And I know you kind of touched on quite a bit of value that you saw from the data, but um, what's the biggest piece that you, you think that you found from the data? Honestly, just understanding the why of why people travel it's like i i always dislike when i go into a 
public consultation and I always get comments back saying this is congested and then I have no way of validating whether they're right or putting into perspective on what people are saying right and and even if someone tells me something is congested like I said that's just a symptom of a of a deeper issue right the fact that people are traveling there it's not because their car decided to travel them there it's because they got up in the morning brushed their teeth and said i need to go to work or you know i want to visit my friend or i want to visit my family right and so those are real human actions that create that and so i guess that's the key value we got from it, is understanding why are people going or get where are people going and with that knowledge we were able to look at land uses and, and give an educated guess on why people were going so for instance in our study area and we noticed that there was a very low peak in the morning peak, um, which we thought was a bit odd because it was a bit of a downtown core commercial. It had been dealing with a bit of, you know, neglect over the past few years. But then we noticed that there was a higher peak in the evening. And we understood that that was because there was a lot of university bars in the area, a lot of student housing. And so in the morning, their, their schedules and stuff were not as pronounced. But in the evening, they all went you know, to the bar, to party, you know, on Fridays or, or 30, Thursdays and stuff like that, right? So it just helped us kind of click into place. You know, these are the land uses. These are the people that live in there. What are we seeing for mobility? Ah, this may be why this is going on. And you talk to them and, you know, it, it does add credibility. So I guess that's the biggest value is just, you know, oftentimes you look at stuff and you want to do a very accurate model. You want to make it some miraculous, miraculous thing. But at the end of the day, it's ultimately going to come down to the assumptions you put into it. And if I have terrible assumptions, but really accurate traffic volume, you may lead to, you know, just as bad recommendations than, you know, having less accurate volume data, but having better, you know, distribution assumptions, for instance. Fantastic. Well, looks like that's all, those are the only questions that we've had come in. Uh, we can give it a couple more seconds, see if any last minute stragglers pop in. Um, but Brandon, we're really appreciative of you talking to us and going through your presentation today. It was super interesting. Great, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. And those were super good questions. I mean, those are great questions. I mean, those are questions clients will ask. And I mean, my my philosophy is always to be honest. Like I'm not. And, and I know Urban SDK's philosophy is, to be honest as well, you know, at the end of the day, the data is what the data is, and we just have to be transparent about it and understand, hey, you know, we understand that you're spending an arm and a leg trying to do a $300,000 model. Maybe we can get, you know, within a, a stone's throw of that accuracy with something like this uh, that can give us better insights into other areas, for instance, right? So it's kind of, I'm not saying that it's, you know, just having big data is a, as a solution to all your your problems right but it's that balance of understanding hey do we can we use this tool is it effective in this instance because you know it fits that it fits that uh that need absolutely yeah we we totally agree honesty is the best policy so loved that answer well thank you so much everyone for hopping on today uh, we've really appreciated you guys attending um, and we, this was recorded, so you guys will be getting re a recording of it, um, just in case you had to hop in early or hop off. I guess hop off early, hop in late. Um, everyone have a great rest of your week, and we will talk to you guys soon. Take care. Bye.